A. What's up, Aspen? Yeah, let's go. So y'all know, my name's Jocelyn, but you can call me JoJo. We gonna get straight into some work. What's up, Jacob? My name is Jay. Y'all already know I uh, came to the stage earlier, but we don't got too much to say. We got a video to play for y'all and some dope spoken words. So y'all already know the house rules. When y'all hear something that resonates, let's hear them finger snaps. Oh yeah, it sounds like a slam poetry night in here. Let's get it. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So before we go up, I'ma let y'all know that as being artists, sometimes it has the we out here showing you guys our heart. And we sensitive about our stuff, like our Queen Lauren Hill says it, you know what I mean? So this, po this poem is gonna be called Deeply Rooted in the OYU Network. You guys can play the videos. Deeply Rooted. If you want me to get real deep with you, why do they hate us? My father jumped over the border to raise us. Why do they hate us? As I walked in this stage and show greatness. Yes, you see me in this white suit, but do you really know my roots? My brown, divine, ranchera, multi-dimensional roots. I found moves to shift rooms. If you got the hood with you, you got the world with you, and that's opportunity youth. Youth, meet, and master resistance. We are the act of resistance, simply with our existence. Pass the torch. I don't compete, I complete. Love, live on valued energy. Give me a little bit. Children, youth, and elders, spiritually we collect the love we hold within greatness. The love that awakens our brothers and our Sisters across the bridge, three generations steward, stewarding lessons from our ancestors, the head and spiritual masters. My dad ran across the border like Ocho Cinco. We had real life work. We couldn't wait on no bingo. So deeply rooted I am. You can see the trees in my veins, the roots in my heart. Let failure strike, it'll still find me working. With faith and courage to speak, we can defeat the enemy and be the change that we want to see. Red, white, blue, but they rip us apart. Mm. Politically, we may fight. I'm in the middle. I don't lean to the left or the right. But think about what happened here in Texas. Vanessa Guillen, think about that story. We in Texas intentionally. Politically, we may fight, like I said, but like Wu-Tang said, you gotta protect your neck. Mm. Musically, we create, heal as we recognize the wounds of generations, that's lyrical greatness. Mm. I'm a shape-shifting chica. I'm not here to talk about religion. I'm here to talk about energy, spirituality, the youth, and our reality. Person to person, we feel the frequencies collide aroused simultaneously to create what we're destined to be collectively. Youth are the centering point, middle man, the one to see, the one to be seen, but also unseen. Make it make sense. Youth are the ones that sometimes don't have a role model and are the role model. What a duality. Faith over fear. I'm your mental health baddie of the year. And let me tell you though, I'm your homie who can also write grants and in fact, your homie who can impact and enchant. Act like you knew, I'm a reflection of you. Like a beautiful summer view, see and recognize that I am deeply, deeply rooted. Ten toes. Ten toes. Ten toes. Ten toes, ten toes down, I stay rooted to this soil. Ten toes, ten toes down, I stay rooted to the soil. To see the fruits of my labor all day, I plan and toil. Recognizing, strategizing, reminding members of my city their existence is royal. 
kings and queens. We shoot for dreams and don't miss because we don't mix with quitting just like water and oil. Empowering our youth only strengthens our root. Conducting surveys and research to document the proof. This work that we do, this, this OYU work that we do, from Jamil, LaShawn, and Kimberly too, is the hood. Is the hood's megaphone to amplify the truth to policymakers, to planning commissioners, to the movers and shakers that transform a room. We have to exercise our political enterprise, which is our influence. And that is how we stay deeply rooted. Jacob. Jacob. Jacob, I'm Jocelyn Gama. I work for Urban Strategies Council, and right now we're working on the Oakland General Plan update. I'm the youth co coordinator. What does being deeply rooted in opportunity youth mean to you? Well, to me, Jocelyn, you know, being from East Palo Alto in the Bay Area, California, make some noise, Bay Area. <laughs> being deeply rooted to me is knowing where you're from and representing that wherever you go. You know, being unapologetic about what you do, what your purpose is, what you're manifesting for your life. And if you know that you're walking in that right purpose for yourself, you have nothing to question. So for me, being deeply rooted is knowing that even when I'm thousands and thousands of miles away from EPA, I'm still right here, baby. Come on, let's go. Now, my name is Jacob Verges. Uh, I'm a co-coordinator for the Oakland General Plan as well. We're doing a lot of civic engagement work, trying to amplify the, uh, the voice of the youth in our community. What does being deeply rooted mean to you? To me, being deeply rooted is knowing my story, knowing his story, knowing her story, and knowing that although there may be so many stories, you are the one that defines your story. To me, being deeply rooted is being authentically who you are. To me, being deeply rooted is getting in your mind, in your heart, and in your soul, feeling that spirit that's within you. And like I'm gonna always keep on saying, what are we? Deeply, deeply rooted. rooted. Thank you. deeply rooted in some conversation that I hate to break up, my friends. <laughs> Yay! I see some friends out there. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. There we go. My name is Meg Long. I am with Blue Meridian Partners, um, and I was formerly with Equal Measure, who has served as the evaluation partner for Opportunity Youth Forum. And I am so humbled to be here with you. Uh, celebrating 10 years of the history of this incredible network that is deeply rooted. Um, and it is a particularly emotional time for me, feels particularly uh, like a homecoming moment. Um, and I'm thrilled to be a very fine thread in the single garment of destiny to pull from the quote of Mar Dr. Martin Luther King from our book march. Um, I'm going to ask our uh, fellow panelists just to introduce ourselves as we sort of dive into this plenary on, on impact that we've had over the last decade. Um, and then I'll set us up a little bit with some framing, some conversation. Hopefully we get to some Q&A, but I see the clock ticking already, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so Jen, can I ask you for a quick introduction? Yeah, thanks, Meg. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Thompson. I'm a senior director at Equal Measure. 
Kathy Hamilton, Boston Private Industry Council co-convener. Boston in the house. Uh, co-convener of the Boston Opportunity Youth Collaborative. Hi, I'm Sylvia Leal, and I'm the Senior Program Officer for the CLL Temple Foundation in Lufkin, Texas. Awesome. Buenas tardes, yo nací aquí en Mesa Rio. Yo soy Norton President. I cannot believe this has been coming up on nine years. Um, I'm a Vice President with Strategy Program for Communications, the Slough Rivers and Humble Bay Foundation. It's been a backbone and funder in our region for, oh my gosh, talking about 10 years of impact. Yeah, awesome. So my friends, I want to take a minute to take us 10 years back, right? And what, the, what our sector felt like at the time. Because the truth is, going into this work, we had some ideas, we had some passions. What we did not know was what we were putting forth was actually going to create some incredible momentum in the field. And I don't want to claim that we were the first on everything, but there are 10 things as I look back that we were in some ways way ahead of where the sector is. So I'm gonna offer them to you, and I know you may have sort of seen them flashed on the slides before. I'll offer them to you so we remember where we started. Because the truth is we can live, we must live our life forward. We can only understand it in reverse. To paraphrase Kierkegaard, which I never do. <laughs> um, but just take us back, here we are, right, 2013. The first thing we did as a network is we said, we are gonna lead with our values. And if you have ever heard the nothing about us without us, that started right here, right here with this network before the field woke to the idea of proximate leadership. And our youth, our youth leaders co-created this network, nothing about us without us. The sector has suffered from a talent deficit over the past few years after COVID. The network, no way. This network from the very beginning started investing in a deep bench of leadership for our youth. That was foreshadowing the leaders that we needed and who you will celebrate in the closing today. In 2013, the first plenary session that we had for the Opportunity Youth Network named explicitly structural racism as one of the things that we were working together to dismantle, named it before the sector was brave enough to name it for the public. This is also, as we, we discussed earlier throughout the uh, convening, this is a network that pushed targeted universalism at the forefront, right? Setting a bold vision and recognizing that in order to achieve that vision, that set of goals, we must have targeted, explicit strategies to get us there. We led with values. We also changed hearts and minds, right? This is a network. How many of you remember the past term that used to be used for opportunity youth? Who remembers? What is it? Disconnected, disconnected youth. We changed the narrative. We're not disconnected. Youth aren't disconnected. The systems that serve our youth are disconnected. We have opportunity. That was a narrative change moment for this network. We grew up during the Obama administration. We weathered the Trump administration and we are thriving in the Biden administration. Opportunity youth is not a partisan issue. And finally, we said, you know what? We were challenged to work differently. We had to collaborate differently. We were not going to do a single organizational turnaround. We weren't going to do systems change in the way that we had been tackling it to date. We said, we got to put our money where the mouth is. So we're a financial aggregator of over $30 million that have been uh, working to support the community efforts underway. $30 million aggregated over the course of this decade. We also said, this isn't just a national issue. It's not just a local issue. We have to work at the local, state, and national levels. And this isn't an urban, suburban, rural, or indigenous issue. It's all of our issues. So we have to build a network that represents, as we have in our panelists today, 
those perspectives, urban, suburban, rural, and indigenous. And finally, everybody said, mm -mm, this isn't going to work because opportunity youth fall through the cracks of the data system. Can't find them, can't track them. And we said, nope. These are opportunity youth, not disconnected youth, and we know where to find them and we know how to convert the system. So that's where we started. And today we're going to take a minute to celebrate at a very high level, because we don't have a ton of time, and there's a lot of celebrating to have, the impact that this network has had. Because we weren't just performing, we were changing things. So Jen, I'm going to pass it to you to give us a little bit of an overview at the very high level from the network of what changed over the past decade. Okay, thanks Meg. Um, so in the spirit of reflecting over the past decade, I'm going to talk uh, at a high level about findings from the evaluation. Um, so just to start, Equal Measure has been evaluating the OIF network really since the beginning. We were involved in uh, sort of a planning phase, an initial three-year evaluation, followed by equity counts where the common measures were developed, um, and we're continuing to uncover learnings today. So I'm going to again be sharing at a high level learnings across this entire period. As evaluators, we, we look at the network as a whole, and here's a map of, of what it looks like or what it looked like in 2021, um, which we know has grown from 21 communities back in 2015 when we started the evaluation to over 40 today. And our evaluation has focused on collecting and analyzing data from the key components of the theory of change, so collaborative capacity, systems change, as Meg mentioned, values, the core values that drive this network. And ultimately, by shifting systems, that will lead improve outcomes for young people. So we collect both quantitative and qualitative data um, through an annual self-assessment, interviews, and through the common measures which we use publicly available data. So I'm going to walk through four areas of impact from the last decade. First, collaboratives in the OIF network have steadily increased their capacity to improve systems and outcomes for opportunity youth. So when we talk about increased capacity, we really mean improvements in infrastructure and processes to bring together cross-sector partners and to work together and coordinate efforts towards a common goal. So this includes things like broad and inclusive partnership and leadership, structures for working together and sharing information, and the data, staff, and resources to do the work. So we've seen over the last decade um, that capacity has steadily increased. Our more recent data from the, more, from the recent evaluation from 2019 to 2021 has shown this pattern as well, as well as in within each of the four types of capacity, it has remained steady or increased, with the notable exception of 2020, which of course was very tragic. So why does capacity matter? For one, we've consistently found in our data that collaborative capacity matters for systems change. We've consistently found a strong correlation or relationship between collaborative capacity and the ability to shift systems. Second, OIF networks are changing systems. I think this is a really unique part of OIF. It's not about fixing people, it's about changing systems. K to 12, post-secondary, workforce, human services, so that they better serve young people. As Professor Powell said this morning, it's changing structures. And this approach really gets at the root causes of youth disconnection and at disparities. <coughs> Over the years, we've documented a number of systems changes that the OIF collaboratives have made, from laying the groundwork to be able to do systems change, to changing practices, policies, and ways of working, such as increased coordination between programs and organizations that serve opportunity youth, building relationships with policymakers to be able to influence policy and funding, and narrative change. As Meg mentioned, changing how leaders and community members think and talk about opportunity youth. Um, as Dr. G said, moving from problem to possibility. And over the last eight years or decade, we've seen evidence of shifts in local systems. Our recent data uh, shows that overall systems change has increased from 2019 to 2021 in most of the seven types of systems change that are on the screen. Um, 
have also increased, again, with some dips in 2020. These are not dramatic changes, but slow and steady increases because we know systems change work is for the long haul. We also know that while we look at trends at the overall network level, that the network is made up of a group of diverse collaboratives and communities, and that each context, social context, political, geographic, mm -hmm. can greatly influence how collaboratives do systems change work. Third, collaboratives in the OI net OIS network are increasingly using data to influence and shift systems. The need for data was identified early on in the evaluation as important for building the movement, sharing the vision, bringing people in, and showing impact. And FCF invested in data, and we see the results of that. In the recent evaluation, as well as across the last decade, we've seen evidence of growth in data capacity and using data within and across systems. A couple of examples. We see some communities establishing common data definitions, which allows them to share and look at data at a systems level. We see data work groups and communities of practice to collectively look at data to inform changes in practices, professional development, and advocacy. In addition, collaboratives are using multiple sources of data to understand young people in their communities. The common measures allow for looking at youth disconnection in a, system, in a consistent way across the network, with data showing positive mm -hmm. downward trends in youth disconnection pre-COVID. And this matches the national trend that Moses shared yesterday, the open for summary. And lastly, but certainly not least, the collaboratives in the OIS network center young people. Youth have been actively involved in the collaboratives work, and youth are informing decisions and collaborative, and this has been building over the last decade. Young people are leaders in the movement as well as in, within each collaborative. Young people understand systems best. They use their lived experience to spur ideas for change. Collaboratives provide programs and services to many young people in their communities. About 60,000 young people participated in programs offered by OIS collaborative programs in 2021, with thousands earning credentials, participating in training programs like apprenticeships, and gaining impact. So that's just a very high level of what we found over the last decade. And I'm happy to give you the floor. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll frame you up. Thank you, Jennifer. So that was a, hopefully you, you saw yourself in this network-wide story of impact. It's an important documentation of the changes that have happened so that we can communicate this externally. And we want to give it a little more texture and really get a, get a little bit of a sense of how this felt and the changes um, that come most to mind um, in our places. So Kathy, I'm gonna ask you to give us a little texture of. Uh, what impact you've had in Boston and what you'd love to elevate for collaboration with you. Sure, sure. Well, we've, we've been at this for um, actually 20 years. We've got two parties to have because we started working on the high school dropout rate with a collective impact process in 2004 with youth transition funders group. And so we spent a couple years doing research. That was what they funded. It was quantitative, qualitative. Talked to parents, talked to teachers, talked to students. Um, looked at population data, looked at school district data, and we chewed on this for two years, you know, setting the groundwork you were talking about. And then we wrote a report called Too Big to Be Seen, published it, had a big event, got press coverage for it, um, and came out, told the story at different levels, systems level, personal level, barriers, challenges, and we didn't have the conversations as structurally as we do now, but we had six policy and practice recommendations, ranging from early indicators like Bob Balfour and early intervention, do something about it, don't just measure it. We had, um, you know, re-engage dropout. That was a new idea back then. Um, nobody was doing it and people thought it was crazy. So things like that. And so the next challenge was implementation. The PICS started to ro get the ball rolling with the convener by, um, hiring two, two former dropouts to do dropout re-engagement in the district, helped us place them within different schools in the district. So then everybody else started doing stuff, right? Because in Boston, we're kind of competitive a little bit. <laughs> so even, we're collaborative and we're competitive. So the school districts like not to be outdone. So they did a big Parthenon segmentation study that showed us what the characteristics of 
um, off-track students were, so they started developing interventions for them, shoring up the alternative ed system, a brand new credit recovery program, a tiered intervention system over the years. And as people in the nonprofit partners were right in there with them, partnering them. And as we did that, the rates went down. Our researcher says we can't prove cause and effect, but I'm going to let you draw your conclusions. <laughs> and at the same time, graduation rates, which were brand new back then, um, went up the four. And we also chose a five year just to honor people working with students that extra year to th at their graduation. Um, and then in 2008, we decided to turn to the post-secondary challenge because we were doing a study and we discovered only 35% of Boston Public Schools graduates who enrolled in college ever finished college mm -hmm. within six years. And that was like scandalous, right? People are, are not used to numbers like that. So when we announced it with the mayor and the Boston Foundation, we really had to have a strategy to address it. So TBF um, put in a lot of money and said, we're going to support this thing called post-secondary coaching, where we're going to provide wraparound support um, and the like. We're going to advocate for students. And these are all students of color. So this is a racial equity issue. That's, that's who's in Boston public schools, by and large. So um, once we started those interventions and the tables, you could see the college enrollment rate went up and the college completion rate went up. We, we set a goal of doubling it from 35 to 70. However, Fast forward, we're kind of a little stuck with the completion rate and um, we're going down in the college enrollment rate. And so then in 2013, along comes Aspen and says, well, why don't you look at um, a different group, a, a broader span, 16 to 24 year olds, and why don't you consider population level data? So we did, we've kind of been looking at these numbers over the years and the number that we had when we started was 11,645. Mm -hmm. That's a lot for a town like Boston. So mm -hmm. again, we had a similar method. We drew the partners together. We had a facilitator who's deep roots, talk about deep roots, um, in the community, Mo mm -hmm. Barbosa, and he mm -hmm. led us through a research and design process. People were fancy in that group. They wanted to do design. Um, <laughs> and we were really grateful to have Aspen convening us and giving us all these great ideas. Um, for how to think about the problem, one of which was youth voice and providing us the funds to hire young people and hire an agency, BSNI, with real expertise in developing youth leadership. So as we kind of gathered the numbers and looked at our systems, we drew maps of pathways that went from across high school, GED, and into post-secondary. We decided to fo focus on post-secondary because that's who is in our OY population, thanks to data that Aspen encouraged us to collect. And then ultimately we did what the youth told us to do. You see it all here, I won't read it, but we started a connection center with SIF funds from Aspen because that's what they said they wanted and they helped us staff it. Um, and we ran that for three years, serving about 500 young people. It was like 18 to 24 year olds who needed career navigation services. And um, we followed that by working with a different population led by United Way, who's here in the room, Amanda and Sam. Um, they wanted to take the career navigation to public housing and the state agency paid for it. So for another four years, we did that um, and learned some lessons from both of those. So now we're looking at doing a structural change as a workforce board where we're gonna try to use the career centers, which is the mechanism that really has the resources to find pathways into employment and training and provide more wraparound services within those centers, which haven't had that. So we're piloting that. We don't know if it's gonna work, but I think Aspen always pushes us to dream bigger. So we're gonna take the risk because we know y'all got our backs <laughs> if we don't make it. And we'll right. learn from it. And that lesson will inform the next step because we don't give up just because we fail. We keep going. Um, and then I think I'm gonna pause here the only other thing is, I, I guess we're asked to talk about our indicators. Um, you see, we use a lot of indicators. But beyond that, I think it's like, we're no longer thinking of high school graduation. We're thinking of the life course that we set mm. people on. And what happens mm -hmm. after high school? Do you go to college? Do you get job training? So 
you know, that is working with high school to transform it as well as working with the rest of the system, which is a lot, because it's a lot of different databases and it's a lot of places for young people to navigate transition, but it's the work and we're there for it. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <coughs> and an another first that you reminded me of the life course mm -hmm. framework for those that might remember mm -hmm. the, the ecosystem of mm -hmm. this work. Um, over the duration of time, thank you so much. Sylvia, I know we, we, we connected a lot about data, which as you know, is a deeply rooted concept in this work. I'd love to hear um, some of your reflections on that from yourself. Uh, well, I have a few slides that I'd like to share with you about uh, our work and what we're doing. And uh, data continues to be the challenge, right? How to capture the right data. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, as I mentioned before, I work for the foundation, the TLL Temple Foundation. It's located in uh, East Texas, and we like to say Deep East Texas, as you can see by the map. Uh, I provided a map for, for those of you that are not in Texas, but even those of you that are in Texas, maybe have never been out there. It's uh, our foundation works with 23 counties, uh, one county in uh, Arkansas. And you can see by the picture there, it is uh, very rural. It's, uh, we have the national forest there, it's beautiful. Mm. We have about 1.5 million people outside of Harris County. Harris County is where Houston is, just to give you an idea. We include Harris County in our service area, but they will skew the data. So together with Houston, it's 5.1 million. But outside of Houston, in the rural area, is really the focus that we're focused on. Not a lot of philanthropic, philanthropic uh, investments in this area, and our foundation wants to focus in on helping these small and rural communities. Uh, but like other small rural communities, we also have challenges that often you find in very small communities, uh, and rural communities that we find in the forest here, it's like I like to call it. They're very small. Some, some of uh, our communities have like 700 people. Uh, others mm -hmm. have 2,000 people. The largest city that uh, where I live in, in Lufkin, kind of in the center there, has 35,000 people, and that's the big city, okay? Uh, we have high poverty in these rural areas. We have a high need for infrastructure. We have lack of infrastructure for, for health care. We lack health care uh, facilities, health care workers amongst the rural community. We also lack broadband. So we, during the pandemic, when everybody said everybody had to turn to virtual, let's go to virtual. It wasn't that easy when you don't have that infrastructure. So our school leaders, who I'm very proud of, were, were very creative in, in finding ways to stay connected with students outside of, of not having that broadband opportunity. We have about 120 school districts across that area, with 82% of those school districts have less than 1,000 students kinder through 12th grade. Um, that also means that they're very far and distant from the closest higher ed institution close to them. So we have low matriculation rates. And when you have one car, somebody mentioned it earlier today, I don't remember who. When you live in a small rural and uh, you, you're, you're coming out of poverty, you know, and you have a family who's trying to make ends meet, they may or may not have a car. The closest institution, higher ed institution college, is like 60 to 70 miles away. You're asking these students to take what? Their only family vehicle and drive 70 miles to a class. It's not realistic. So our foundation was very interested in finding how do we do this work? How do we help our young people with, in the midst of all of these challenges? And uh, we, uh, we're invested in a project that we call the Deep East Texas uh, College and Career Centers uh, Alliance, excuse me, that includes uh, uh, six uh, school districts that you can see up there, proudly have their, their emblems up there, uh, four institutions of higher education. But the mission is to connect these young people to opportunities that are out there, to jobs, uh, opportunities, to a better life, to a livable, a livable wage job that they have. One of the things that I like about the way these uh, school districts have collaborated is collectively, collectively the six districts make up 
about 1,800 students, 1,800 students. So now they're starting to look like a typical uh, traditional high school. And they have bargaining power with our institutions of higher ed. Uh, but they also are able to maximize their resources. So they come together and they collaborate about resources. That includes teachers who teach dual enrollment courses. That means equipment. Uh, that means even staffing. Even though they all have counselors, one counselor might have a really good idea for how to uh, conduct their uh, scheduling for their students to attend these courses. And so they share with others. So they share a lot of ideas. The six uh, superintendents of these school districts come together every month. And I like to uh, share that one of our superintendents said not too long ago, and I go personally, she says, to these meetings. I don't send anybody else because I am the one who, ha who can make decisions about what I can offer for my, uh, for my school district and what resources I can offer. So I come to every meeting, and that's one of the requirements that they have. Uh, another thing before we leave this slide that I wanted to share with you is as we move into talking about opportunity to youth, uh, we, don't have a, we don't have any uh, community-based organizations in these small rural places. Mm. So we have to work through the school districts. The school districts, as small as these communities are, they're the hub of that community. Everything happens at the school. Uh, so when they need shelter, they go to the school. They need to talk to whatever, a meeting or whatever they want, they go to the school. So the school is at the hub of this area. So we work through the school districts, which is very different, uh, Meg, when we start to collect data mm -hmm. in, a, in a different way, right? Because some of our other partners that we see in the, in the Opportunity Youth uh, Network Partnership are, are nonprofits. So they're looking at it from a different lens. Um, and so what we're doing here at this, uh, let me just rush it a little bit, is they're offering, again, <coughs> career pathways, connections to regional labor market reports. So the first thing we did is we conducted, through our foundation, we commissioned a labor market report to find out are there any jobs? Because you go to these little small communities <coughs> and, it's, and what we would hear from the superintendents is there's nothing here. There's nothing for our students. Our students graduate to the couch is what they would say. But in fact, the labor market report that we commissioned revealed something very different. It revealed that there were really jobs available. The issue was that the jobs that were available within uh, a short 30 minute drive required skill post-secondary training, either a level one certificate, level two, or associate's degree to move into that. So I already shared with you that it was difficult to, because of the distance to have our students travel. So we had to find ways to find post-secondary educators to come into this area and bring college to them, to our students, while they were still in high school while they're still supported by their network of their high school principals, high school teachers, high school counselors, and all of the network supports that we already have built into the school uh, to help them leap over that. And, and uh, here's some of the areas <coughs> that, oh, they already came down. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, these are some of the areas that we worked on. Uh, some of the data, I'll just move real quickly. Uh, what we're finding out is that we also use this approach to, in, to involve opportunity to use. So although this is, was focused, the DEXA program was focused on high school and helping our opportunity youth in high school move through high school towards a livable wage job, we also had to think about opportunity youth that had already left the system or not in the system for whatever reason and give them an opportunity to come back and connect. So we're very consciously aware of the of how this how to leverage this work to help opportunity youth 16 through 24 that's our target uh, since then we've uh, since 2019 we've impacted over 174 opportunity youth 31 have completed certification and 21 are employed and the one thing I can tell you about data that that I constantly ask questions about is we need to find better ways to connect the data because it's like it's where where do we know who we're talking about? How do we show impact? How do we help people tell the story of the real work that's going on out there? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll pause there for 
and pass it over to Michelle. Please, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, John. Yes, yes thank you. Um, that was a, thank you for our, um, shining a spotlight on the infrastructure that you have in rural communities and also um, the overlap between using labor market data and narrative change, um, the quote you authored from our um, superintendent was talking about. Michelle, I know you're bringing some voices into the room for us, um, but I also know that this idea of targeted universalism is something that really struck, um, that was a big focus for your community and thinking generally about racial equity and justice and an important voice in your work, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was so hard, you know, reflecting on the nine years of, of work in our community and really even before that, um, again, recognizing multiple collaboratives and work and people that had come before and, you know, been some of these organizations and work doing this for, you know, 30 years, generational work, you know, mothers sharing with their daughters then what, you know, needed to come in communities. Um, it was really hard to pick, like, what, yeah, what do I share? Um, so I wanted to start with just my story and if we can turn our slides up real quick. Um, I'll just give one example of this and then we'll show a little bit of a film clip. Um, Do we have slides? Oh, we did not. Only the video? Oh, That's fine, mm -hmm. okay. Go ahead and we'll show the video then. That's the video? Mm -hmm. You were engaged from the beginning with an end, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, what about the tribes? It was like, the tribes are part of this community, and we are, we can't be separate. We are moving forward, we walk step together. We have folks sitting at the table that have never sat at the table together. Throughout my time at BHC, there's never been a time where I felt that I wasn't being listened to and valued. They really do care about making sure that young people are able to share their side of the story. Across the board, young people to adults, even elders, are now feeling more comfortable speaking out on their own behalf. They have really taken great strides into being their own best advocate. We have the power. You can make the difference. It's a real, tangible thing, and that's what the process of organizing is supposed to show you. It's your own power. Your opinion and your voice is important because you are a part of this community. When you bring those ideas forward and you bring your voice forward, that is making a change in the community, no matter what. We value our students and we value our student voices. And they show up to contribute to us and for us to contribute to them. We built a culture where they depend on us and we depend on them. And our students become the teachers. We are that community, they are that community. I see connectedness between adult, youth, teaching each other about resiliency. In schools, for example, it wasn't the adults who were saying, this is what we think is happening and what you need to do. It was the kids who were saying, this is what we are experiencing and this is what we want to do. And then there was this support network of people who said, all right, let's help you send that message forward. Resiliency is powering through, even though you're going through maybe some tough times, that we can overcome this. And as a community, have youth empower everyone. Everybody's important to this community, our kids, elders, everybody, because we're all special. Not just within schools do we look at academics and behavior, but we also look at the social emotional part of the child. We look at the whole child, and through this approach to building healthy communities, we're looking at the whole community. You don't really see the hand of the Building Healthy Communities Initiative, because that's not how they work. They work with getting people to change systems and policies so that those people can make change in the community. One of the intents of building healthy communities was to teach us how to make our community sustainable. It was to teach us how to truly understand if there's a problem, how to dissect it, how to get to the root of the problem, how to co-design a change, and then beyond that, how to make that change sustainable. This is a tool that cannot be kept to ourselves or to our community. It's part of what can help to heal, not only our community, but heal our world. And it starts here. Community makes a town into a hometown. There's a bright future ahead, but only if you turn the lights on. Basically, all of me is a product of 
my family and the place where I live, the least I can do is come back and put my hat in the ring, so to speak, to try to make it a bit of a better place. Don't let anybody write your story for you. Write your own story. Create your own narrative. It's not really finding your own home here. It's kind of like make it your home. Because the world is really how you shape it to be. Community is not just one single person. It's not just one single group or organization just trying to bring everyone together. It has to be and everyone has a part in it movement. Because the community is not just one person being in the pack, it's everyone doing what they can to lead everyone forward. I love my community. <laughs>
and her imagining, right, playing and becoming a doctor, that that's, that's what she wants to do. And she was pregnant with my son during the pandemic. Um, so she took a very serious role. <laughs> <laughs> this picture is also about impact. Because we were in a community that said we couldn't bring back an RN program. We were too small. And that we couldn't graduate nurses at our community college. And then when we went and did empathy interviews with local nurses and doctors about what their journey was to stay in the community, they said, you know, I mortgaged, I had a second mortgage on my house. I drove three hours every day to make it to classes. And we said, that's not good enough. We, we can do something better. And so we rebuilt that program with the community college. And we got all the employers, everybody together and said, how can we do this? And they did it. So this picture is the first graduating class of RNs. They graduated in 2020. <laughs> and you know what they did? So before they got their certificates, they were already working in the hospitals because it was the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Every single one of them. And that's the impact. That's, that's the story. Thank you so much, Michelle. And um, you know, in true OI fashion, as we said, we lead with the head, the heart, and the spiritual. So thank you for bringing um, all those dimensions to the conversation. And I know you thought this was a super dry conversation yeah. about impact, <laughs> but we can't talk about um, the changes that we've helped uh, put in motion uh, without tapping into all three of those dimensions. So I'm going to take a deep breath. Um, I'm going to ask the panel a, sort of a question, a reflection a little bit about the unique characteristics uh, of this network and you know, what has really stood out to you or resonated. And while I'm doing that, uh, we will have time to engage you in this conversation. So whether it's a question you have, a comment disguised as a question, we know what those sound like, <laughs> straight up comment. Um, uh, we want to bring you in the conversation in a moment. So have that in your thoughts. Uh, but for our panel, and this is now, now we had a little bit of the show and share <laughs> element. Um, so now just really for whoever it moves, reflecting on this network, and you know, we talked a little about the unique characteristics <coughs> and approach to this work. I'm just curious if there's any dimension that particularly resonates with you, that particularly changed the way that you think about this work that you just want to elevate for us. Can go ahead and start. <coughs> I want to first acknowledge the, the depth of your story and what you brought. Second time today. <laughs> um, I feel like um, the focus on racial equity and youth voice together <coughs> has been really important. And I feel like the way Aspen brings it even more so than the content. Like every time we come together, we hear from the giants who are doing the impossible or what people would think was impossible, like Dr. Ginwright, like John Powell, like the Shendo brothers in New Mexico who are changing the education system to reverse the whole boarding school tendency and affirm culture and history. Um, and then in San Francisco, the folks that are working on reparations talk about hard, super hard, and bringing the, the gentleman <coughs> actually won re reparations for the Japanese Americans at the state and national level, just, I just feel humbled and blown away. And honestly, when I come back and even when we talk in our team time as a Boston team and process all this, it makes us set goals. It makes us dream big. So, you know, now our mayor's office is looking at expanding tuition free from a targeted group of folks at the community college to everybody. They haven't funded everybody yet, but they've substantially increased it. And then United Way, who's with us, as I said, has had a strategic planning process and creating, created an OY priority for funding um, for youth programs. So we're very excited about that. And we're trying to sustain youth voice because we've had like very, pro we really got the Aspen message and have gotten Aspen support over the years for youth voice, but it's kind of been project-based, so not sustain, mm -hmm. sustained. 
So we're currently working on trying to develop a sustained fund with United Way for Youth Voice so we can have consistent and powerful youth leadership at the table. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add, th uh, thank you, Kathy. I'd like to add that uh, I think this work, uh, and I'm thinking about the communities that we're working with in, uh, in the rural setting, it brings hope. Mm. I mean, when you have, mm -hmm. when you have superintendents telling you that the students graduate to the couch because there's nothing there from them, it seems like everybody in the community was just hopeless, feeling like there was really nothing there. And, and this work bringing attention to opportunities and finding ways, and then we did the, as I mentioned, the labor market report to show that there really was opportunity, then really galvanized the idea of, well, what can we do to connect them to mm -hmm. those jobs that are available? Mm -hmm. And that brought those superintendents to really start thinking about what were the barriers and how do we pull them apart and what do we need? Well, I can do this and I can do that. And uh, now we have students that are, that are not going through the school system and finding their path, uh, but also having uh, young people who maybe were not, all, who had left the school system for whatever reason, now coming back to the door as well to DEPCA and saying, hey, I know I haven't been in school a while, but is there something here for me? And you, I don't know, I didn't mention it, but you know, uh, Nicole Colvin, who's leading that work right now in, in that Jasper region with the three counties, uh, is working very closely with Workforce Solutions. Mm. So it's like, what can you do? Do you have any funds here? No, we're here. Our economic developer who's trying to bring industry and, and business into this area is also contributing funds to this opportunity for, for our students. So I see the school districts, and I remember I told you they were the hubs. I see the school districts and the community through these school districts really starting to look at things differently, like there is opportunity here. We just have to figure out how to connect our young people to these good jobs. Yeah. So Michelle, that's what anything? I think. I think that I was reflecting on um, this in the earlier session actually, and I was talking with, so part of um, my role in, in being here this year is helping kind of pass the baton to new mm. leadership and bringing in uh, a new team yeah. of folks to make their mark in direction of, of the way that the work's gonna go. And I was talking with Josh about um, what the space has been for me over the years. And it's a dreaming space. Mm. It's an ins inspirational space. And it was also where I could help bring in and, and like, kind of bring in some new co-conspirators where it didn't maybe feel safe in our own community to, to like say that big, bold, crazy idea. But then be like, hey, you wanna come to this conference and learn a little bit and like come kick the tires, see what this is about. Yeah. And um, over and over, like amazing same conversations that happened here became the thing that happened. Um, our E3 program um, is one of the ones that I just absolutely love seeing because it was our workforce center and one of the principals for the continuation school, Tony, who you saw in the film, they started talking. They said, gosh, what could we do? And I was here at one of these conferences. And then came, you know, went back and they, you know, like, okay, like we, we could do this. And you know, so we partnered up and they dreamed up a new workforce employment model that actually works. Yeah. And it was in face of a community that said, well, we tried that, that didn't work. Yeah. And so you shouldn't do anything. And they're like, no, we can do this. We can create a different model. Now that same school district that said we shouldn't do that is like this last week taking credit for the entire program <laughs> at the economic <laughs> summit and they're proud of it and they're paying for it. All right, well that's okay. Yeah. But the magic of being able to come and dream here, like that's, you know, it's, it's a dreaming space. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll debate right. the taking credit, but paying, we'll, 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 we'll see about that. Pants. Jen, I know you have a totally different vantage point. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just thinking, like, it's so interesting to hear impact from your perspective than the, te you know, the texture, you know, I can, I can skew evaluation findings, but hearing from all of you and um, just that I think OIF provides this opportunity to do it your way in your community, and it's just interesting that they hear those different levels of impact. So. Yeah. Awesome. So friends, in order to keep us from skewing evaluation <laughs> findings, are, what questions do you have, what comments? Oh yes, thank you. 
You know, we always need that that first <laughs> brazen, amazing soul. You always need me. No, I'm That's just kidding. Right. Um, we need you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm Jose Perez with the Bridge Makers, um, starting up Good Trouble. Um, so, first of all, I really appreciate the panel, although it's not like the thing young people always go to to dissect, you know, information and <laughs> numbers and crunch them up. It's very <laughs> necessary. Um, so, a big question that I that I kind of have, and it's kind of been in my heart throughout the entire convening is how do we encourage adults to lean into uncomfortability? Because I believe because of the discomfort of adults, systems do not change. And young people suffer because of that. So how do yeah. we, as mentors and as adults that with the lived experience, how have you leaned into the uncomfortability? How have you encouraged your colleagues to lean into the uncomfortability? And what does that look like? jump in with, I mean, not that this is simple, but one of the things in our youth adult partnership spaces that I challenged any of our adults in the space was to listen more and talk less. Yeah. But I'll add to that, talk honest. Like, I think we got to have youth leadership. We got to fund it. We have to treasure it. And we have to be in dialogue. So I went to our own... Um, youth-centered healing session that uh, Sam and Amanda ran. And just the honesty of the conversation. I think because Sam and Amanda have done this a long time and Amanda has been a youth leader, she, she just drew out people. So we listened to the youth who were very honest, but the adults spoke very honestly about, you know, admitting that we're not always well. You know, some of us are in therapy. Like, you know, it's okay to be a bad day have a bad day, and I think of those meetings that start with everybody is a 10. I'm a 10, I've had my coffee, and I really hate those. So I really heard what the youth had to say, because I don't want to feel forced to be a 10 to fit in. And I think when the youth are telling us those things, I just think the more we talk and have those conversations, the more things are gonna change. I'd like to add that uh, for me, sometimes what I've seen is data, uh, and this is why I, I work, and I, I appreciate all of the work that, that you all are doing with trying to capture that data, because it's real easy to get locked into everything is fine and dandy for my day-to-day -day work, and there really isn't a problem out there, because in my little world, there isn't a problem, right? But the data, it, what I have seen, and putting it in front of key people in the community about our opportunity to use really have startled them, surprised them sometimes, they challenge it, this can't be right, yes it is, no it's not, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And once they start to realize that they really are youth out there that need support and moving toward their goals and their mm -hmm. dreams that are part of their own community, uh, I think, uh, well I have seen, the, the adults lean in, they, they do care. Um, and and I, th I think that's important that the data is, th is that important sometimes that I often say bringing people to the table mm -hmm. and understanding what's really happening in their own area, in their own community, not mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, 100 miles away or 200 mm -hmm. miles away, but here in our community, this is what's really going on. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the data and I think sometimes that's the mechanism that I've seen uh, that's been helpful in bringing people to lean into this issue. You know what it sparks yeah. for me um, was a lesson that we had coming out of out of the work and was around how you use the data and shifting from well, we saw a lot of institutions use data as was for victim blaming and lots of narratives and stories mm -hmm. made up about mm -hmm. that and shifting to data shedding light on the systemic issues and that mirror work we could get to different conversations and it was less of a blame game and more about, well, let's understand the structures. What do you think is creating this and let's really dig into it. And that also really helped us it shift when we can see data really be harmful in our community. Okay. I'll just add, you know, one thing, and I love the question because we're, we have to continue to lean into our discomfort, right? It's like through life. Uh, once you're comfortable, uh, you're an ancestor. Um, so, <laughs> but that 
one sink in for a minute. <laughs> um, but you know what? What I want to observe something that is really incredible here, and I'm so once again I'm so humbled to be here because we just had a, a, a panel discussion with blazing lights in our faces, um, <laughs> and Kathy showed uh, some numbers, and two of them in front of 500 people, and two of them were trending downward. That is a really vulnerable moment. Right? Michelle shared a deeply personal story that put all of our vulnerability together on display. And if we can create vulnerable spaces, and we're learning how to do that. This is not, you know, this is, we didn't all graduate uh, with our respective degrees and credentials and like vulnerability is what I totally know how to do. I am a 10 at all times. <laughs> <laughs> with coffee. And vulnerability. I mean, you know, so we're creating, we're learning how to be vulnerable, and I hope that that will create ways for us to lean in into discomfort. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I'm going to bring us to a close. I know we said we'd have a bunch of questions, but we had one. <laughs> so that's a win. Um, but my friends, I want to I end with um, an offering or a call to action or a final takeaway that our panelists would like to offer to this room before we transition to our Yelders who we all stand to learn from. Michelle, can I start with you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the thing I would leave with all of you is to keep working on setting those goals that are about reimagining and dreaming for the future it's really hard to motivate people to work on a goal that's probably negative. Uh, it's not inspiring, right? It's hard to motivate people. But if we can actually get to that, you know, being tying back to yeah. Dr. Jinwright's work, we, you know, we've got to reimagine and talk about what we want for the future. I'll, I'll try to end. Let me see. I had a, various thoughts, but I'll, I'll end with this. I'm going to go with the theme that we've been talking about, belonging. Uh, these conversations over the past few days helped me to think about our, our rural students in these small communities. Uh, I want them to feel like they belong where they want to belong. If they want to live in a small rural space, I want to honor that opportunity for them to, uh, to live and work in the place where they grew up. And helping them find their way through that sometimes uh, un, you know, un, uncharted waters of defining their space because they're in a small rural area, it looks like there's nothing there, is very rewarding. And I think the adults that I'm working with in the rural setting really appreciate that because for our rural students, you know, they, they sometimes have a negative stigma. <coughs> Those of you who come from a rural place, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a stigma, it's kind of like, if you really wanna be something, you not, you've got to lose. That sends a negative, you yeah. know, message to the students who really don't want to leave. That's right. And and here's the opposite. So if you stay, it's bad. But if you leave, it's bad because you abandon your yeah. community, you abandon your your family or whatever that was struggling. So uh, I just I just want to yeah. take back that word and uh, take that back and remind uh, ourselves of the work that uh, rural students uh, deserve to belong they want to live and work and if they want to live and work in rural then we need to understand that there are unique circumstances in a rural setting that may not be there in in other places and so thank Very you nice. mm -hmm. Very nice. awesome. Kathy so I think it's about how we use our collaborative like I was saying to have each other's back to take leadership where it's right for you to take leadership and let others take leadership where they have expertise. Like I'm, I'm not a post-secondary expert. I'll let the Boston Foundation do that. I'm not an expert in what youth need. I'm gonna let the youth take leadership in that. So, and really celebrate their victories and have their back when their, their risk does not pay off. And the most important thing is I would say, keep at it because it's too important not yeah. to. <laughs> Yeah. And I just wanted to share a huge thank you to everyone in this audience, and particularly the OIF collaboratives and site leads that have been working with Equal Measure for 10 years, and 
sharing your data and your stories and experiences so we can all learn together. So thank you. Awesome. Join me in thanking this amazing brazen <laughs> panel. <Thank you. laughs> for the conversation. Check, check. Check, check. How's everyone doing out there today? A lot of great work, you know what I mean? <clears throat> My name is Israel. Israel the visionary. Y'all see me speak today, yesterday. But tonight, I'm up here as the artist, Israel the visionary. Repeat after me. I've been thinking of my mental health. I've been thinking of my mental health to find some joy before my mental melts. I've been thinking of my mental health. Let's go. Let's go. I've been thinking of my mental health. I've been thinking of my mental health to find some joy before my mental melts. I've been thinking of some mental health. To try to make it in this burning house What is well being when you by yourself I was the oldest out my mama's house Got me in the freeholders and government lie My being and status been drifted Now I'm all about the pencils trying to build a well being My mental state is my wealth Always work with urgency Like my mom came to America, the American dream I want to learn to be free But when you down and out On your sad boy vibes and the world is tight Chest filled with anxiety But you can't miss work I got bills to pay That's generational pain When mama used to work late. I was at internships to help food, food on my plate. Ruthlessness with my movement kid. Therapist was my music. Maybe drowning in pictures. I need a hidden and a joy. You're my leaf. I need a wellness just to feed my soul. I've been thinking of my mental health. Find some joy before my mental melt. I've been thinking of my mental health. To find some joy before my mental melt. I've been thinking of my mental health. To find some joy before my mental melts. I'm gonna make it in this burning house. Make it in this burning house. I was thinking of some inner peace. I took to myself a therapy so I could help my mama's pain. My mama's pain. Leave my brother and my sister down the right path. And maybe we could lose love. Mental health ain't talked about, and depression was my best friend. Like I can't react to everything. I need to move with intention. I've been faith in people because I'm big on religion. In the cities where we scared to be brown or Mexican, the attack. We swim in the tsunami waves. We on the 46 president, still see no change. Only more brothers in chains. I'm Mexican invested in climate change. I like my state of mind, right to the right, because we can meet in the middle. This is self love and forgiveness. And then the chain, trying to find a new wave. First, I lost my brother and my cousin. Now that's pain. Like a Malcolm with a new wave. So hope with lyrics I wrote, but for my vibration, I've been thinking on my mental mind. I've been thinking on my state of mind. I love y'all, and if you, this is on all platforms, and this is only track number one to the Wellness Wellbeing project that we've been working on collectively, and 
like I said, I've been thinking of my mental health. We ain't going out, we only going uplift. So I want to send y'all with love. Hope y'all wake up for these next panelists beautifully. They come speak to y'all. Much love. Testing, testing. Is this working? Check, check, check. I've been thinking about my mental health. Hey. 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 That is catchy. That is so catchy. I tell you, we, we were initially planning on maybe doing some sort of energizer. We don't need that. Israel, I mean, man, that's amazing. Uh, I'll tell you, this is a lot different looking up here than looking from down there. So yes, yes. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. How are you enjoying the event so far? Yeah! All right, all right. Very excited to be with you all. We'll do a quick round of introductions and dive into a conversation. My name is Joel Miranda, or when I'm in trouble, my mother calls me Joel Francisco Miranda Rodriguez. <laughs> uh, uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, uh -oh. and then I know to hide. So uh, I, uh, I work with the Global Opportunity Youth Network out of the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions. Um, uh, currently in inspired by the work of the forum, uh, bringing this collective impact model and uh, youth-led uh, change work uh, to currently nine communities across seven countries. And uh, really looking forward to sharing more with you all if you have questions about that. Uh, but before we dive into the conversation, uh, I want you to know who our panelists are because we are in the presence of greatness. So, uh, from, from what direction am I in? Right to left, who you are, what you're about. Right. Start with you, Joe. Wow. This is a beautiful room, packed room. Y'all probably see me all around throughout this whole convening, running back and forth. Um, but Devin Edwards, born and raised in Boston. My brother's keeper of Boston, Fresh Tracks, um, Arbison Youth Forum um, Leadership Council. And when I see this room like this, it, it means a lot because, you know, I can get emotional, but I grew up in this. I grew up in this, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah. My name is Lashawn Amato, born and raised in Boston. Woo, <laughs> um, And I currently serve as the Director of Opportunity Youth United. Amazing. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Shabwich, also born and raised in Boston. 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 And I'm the director of Youth and Young Adult Pathways at the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh -huh. Hello, everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Real quick, if you, real quick, if you know, you know. No, Can I get know. one heartbeat? Um, I'm, I'm Jamil L. Alexander. I am a husband, father, son. Mm. <laughs> I've been honored to serve and grow with and for and with this movement and the following the direction of the young leaders and who they are. So I'm honored to continue to serve and support, uplift, and have offerings to grow together. So, to kill them, we'll kill. Hello, everybody. I don't have as much energy as Jamil. My, <laughs> my coffee's just kicking in. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm receiving it all. Uh, yes. My name is Hikma Shoka. You she, her pronouns. I am from Seattle, Washington, but really, really from um, Ethiopia. I was born and raised there. Mm. I um, am a national council of, on the National Council of Young Leaders with Opportunity Youth United. Mm. Also, I think all of us kind of wear a million and one, yes. one hat yes. <laughs> over here, but I'm also um, the program director of youth engagement at a national organization called Every Heart Counts. Mm. Really excited mm. for this conversation. These are some of my favorite people, um, yeah. and I'm just grateful to be up here and in conversation with y'all, and there's a whole bunch of other people to witness it, so I'm really excited for it. <laughs> All right. All right. So just to, to set, uh, some context and framing for this conversation, we'll be hearing from my friends, colleagues, family here on stage. Um, 
about what it's like to grow up vis-a-vis -vis the movement in different ways, engaging at the local level, uh, uh, connecting to a, to a community of leaders, adult, caring adult allies through the National OIF movement, and the impact of that work over the last 10 years. And as we, as we reflect on that, I also want, uh, want to invite you all to reflect on what the last 10 years has looked like. Like uh, Meg mentioned this in the previous panel, you know, 2012, right? OIF is launched, right, as we're approaching uh, the, ha uh, the middle of eight years under the Obama administration. There is a moment there, right, and, and as a once young, pers young person of color, a Latino male, there's a moment there where there is a feeling of hope, right? Our communities, right, our communities are deserving, are getting the love, deserve, and, uh, love and attention they deserve, right? We are, we are, we start to see local collaboratives uh, spring up across the country that are engaging young people at the local level, not just as, uh, not just as young people to be served, but as partners in the design and implementation of interventions and actions and pathways, right, leading to this beautiful network that you see here. And along the way, creating a loving, thriving community where young people can be themselves, can lead, can connect, and can heal from the hurt caused by inequity. And, uh, and this inspires, uh, inspires work and an emerging group of partners, funders, young people outside of the US. And so just so you all know, you are part of a global family of leaders, right? Working to create change for the globe's opportunity to use. So thank you all for that inspiration. And within the last 10 years, some interesting things have happened, right? We also see, right, as uh, the Obama administration comes to an end, and that, uh, that administration is a key moment in my life, I'll share, because it was in 2008 that I was first inspired to vote for something, to make sure that my voice was included in something. And it inspired me to dedicate my life to this work. So key moment for me. But we also see, right, we, we've survived four years under another administration that made hate popular again, that began extreme othering and villainizing of people who look like us, uh, people, who are, uh, people who we love, right? The people we're related to. And so once again, and, and so once again right, the, the power and voice and energy of this network and of uh, the Yelders, and we'll talk about that, what that is in a second, is needed. And then yesterday, Monique opens opens the event and, t and shares how the number of opportunity youth has actually gone down, right? That there has been great progress, that hope is still there. And it was just, that contrast was a good reminder that uh, the thing, while the things we are fighting against are still there, the things we are fighting for are what propel us, what motivate us, what energize us. And what makes this all the more special are the people and the allies that we are fighting alongside. And so we're going to get to know some, some of those folks today. Um, I just got goosebumps just looking at y'all. But <laughs> um, so we're going we're gonna to hear about what, that, what those 10 years are like, what it's like to grow up, come into leadership, define success for oneself, and also do some visioning for the future. So let's jump right into that conversation. My mouth's getting dry. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to start first. Uh, just having a conversation. Oh, actually, no, Jamil. Let's let's let me back up a second. How many people here know what the term yelder means? Uh, <laughs> see a few hands. A see a few hands. Anybody want to share quickly from the audience what yelder means? Young elder. Young elder. Thank you. Thank you. The term was new to me over the last year. And uh, per Jamil, perhaps you can explain a bit about where that came from. Yeah, peep game. So there was a level of, um, you know. Young leaders just kind of hearing it, yelders, yelders, yelders. But then I, as we have our monthly meetings, of course, Hopi Nation, the great Lexi Jean, Sunflower, she literally, she literally was schooling us. And I appreciate whether it be, whether it be Hopi Nation and the Navajo Nation since the beginning. So we saw, we respect, and we've always honored there was a level of schooling like on our monthly meetings, like, okay, there's a, there's a show on Hulu, Reservation Dogs, that came up with this term that actually was a joke. <laughs> Peep game, it was actually was a joke. And of course, you know how we do around the way, we take, any, we take language and make it powerful as, 
as Israel say, our pain, our pain becomes our power. So I got to make sure, thank you for acknowledging that too. So. Awesome. Awesome. So now you all know what yelders are. So we're all, I think I think I might be getting to the point where I can call myself a yinier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 We, we can all use that. <laughs> all right. So moving on to a conversation, I want to reflect a bit about the power of the local collaborative, and and specifically, I want to direct this question to Devin, Amanda, and Hikma. Now, over the past ten years, right, the Opportunity Youth uh, um, uh, Forum. National Network has been committed to supporting and partnering with local collaboratives to engage uh, and partner with local opportunity youth leaders in the design and implementation of strategies to connect young people to the supports and opportunities they need to not only survive, but to thrive. And in doing so, these collaboratives have tapped into the power of proximate leadership, the young people with the lived experience and also the vision for the solutions that our communities need. And they've created, these collaboratives have created, a, in partnership with the young people, have created a welcoming space that engages local opportunity youth and creates a space for them to build and grow together as friends and colleagues. So Hikma, Amanda, Devin, you, the three of you first engaged with the OYF through your local collaboratives in Seattle and in Boston. I'm also from Boston, by the way. Uh, and in Boston. South Queen County. <laughs> uh, in the design and success of local actions and interventions, and in many ways, You've grown up in the movement via, via the local collaborative. And so how has that experience sa shaped your sense of self, your journey into adulthood, and your role and identities as a leader? And uh, I'll start Thank with you, you, my friend. Um, I love this question because it gets me to reflect on like my entry point, I guess, into, into this space. Um, so I actually, my very first interaction with this movement network, all of it, was I think maybe seven or eight years ago, um, I was getting a ride. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, I was getting a ride from a friend, a ride home from a friend who wanted to stop by this event happening that I hadn't heard of called 100K Opportunities Event um, that is hosted by this movement. And I, they used to do these events, huge events um, throughout the country where th basically it was like a job hiring fair. Um, and that's actually where I got my, I didn't mean to go to this event. I honestly went just because I wanted to ride. But um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it worked out, it worked I'm appreciative for that. But <laughs> I went to this event and um, that was my very first time like getting a real job. Um, so they actually hired me on the spot at Starbucks, which I'm from Seattle, Washington. So it's a big, a huge company, but also local to us. Um, and I am a coffee lover, so it was like very exciting for me to, to be hired at Starbucks. But at that event, I was kind of walking through, looking, looking at what, what was going on, and there was one little corner um, of the event where they had highlighted community connections. So there was like one community section that I went to, um, and there was a woman there named Karen Parado who um, I met, and she was just telling me about the work that they're doing in the community, and I had already been doing some like student organizing, youth organizing work in my own spaces. And so from her, she was just telling me that they, there was this um, group called the King County Youth Advisory Council or something like that, um, that was meeting a couple times a month and just organizing with young people. And so that was my very first interaction. I ended up going to their, their meeting in like the next uh, week and I've been connected since then. So just, I think it's so powerful how um, just that one connection, that one entry point can get you into places that you could never even dream of. I always say I accidentally got to this, this place or what is you? Um, I, <laughs> I say that, but honestly, it's all of the people along the way who truly believed in me and supported mm -hmm. me and invested in my um, leadership and personness, to be honest. Mm. And so I'm very grateful for um, Karen who you know, was there only there for like one or two years, but has had really big impacts on my life. Um, and the organization SOAR actually was one of the first um, cats in, well, yeah. we were a community action team that OIU was supporting. So I got involved in that network and you all know how it goes. You get involved once and they never let you go. So <laughs> that's kind of how I've been in this movement and now working for a, non, um, a national organization called Every Hour Counts that, and I'm overseeing, um, an initiative called Powered by Youth Voice. So it's a very full circle moment for me. Mm. Um, yes. We're investing in six different communities.
communities of young people that are doing this exact work that we're talking about up here. So um, again, on accident, but also very much on purpose because I believe in purpose That's and right. I, I'm really excited for um, the little connection points and stories that you all are also going to bring into the space because I think um, it's those stories that make big moments like this where we celebrate 10 years of impact. Mm -hmm. That's right. yeah. The, the, the universe helped us find you. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda? Sure. So when we talk about 10 years ago, in 2012 is when I graduated high school. And the day after I graduated high school, I started as a teacher's assistant because I wanted to work with young people, and then I never left. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I started coming to Aspen in 2015. If you look at our, the slides that are playing, it's kind of crazy to see myself as a 21-year-old now a 29 year old and see myself through the years like on Zoom and in Aspen and in Seattle and in all the places that we've been. So first I'll start with the really good parts which is like how lucky I am to get to do this work. I never thought I would be alive this long much less here uh, and there's not, it's not all amazing. I, I love this work so much and that's what keeps me in it. I love being on stage with my family, that is amazing. Um, but what's not great is that sometimes they don't see that I've grown up. Mm. Mm. So it's still about my lived experience and not about my professional expertise. I've been working with Opportunity for 10 years. And so then I come into spaces thinking like, guys, I've been in this 10 years. 10 years is a long time to be in an industry. Like, that's for real. Uh, and then I start to question myself, like, do these people actually respect me? Or am I like a participation box? Mm. Uh -huh. And do these people really value me like all the other adult colleagues in the room because they know me from when I'm a 21-year-old youth organizer? Mm -hmm. And so it makes it really hard to be in this space sometimes because I feel like we are constantly making the case for young people designing. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about that, it feels invalidating because that's me. Right. I'm saying I can do this. And you're saying, no, you can't. Mm. And I'm saying, but look at all of us, we can all do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it can be really challenging sometimes to hold both. I am a young person, I am a professional, I'm a former opportunity youth. Like all of these things can exist together. Yeah. Uh, and then one more thing I'll say is in 2017 when the Aspen convening was in Boston, the Aspen Forum gave me an award for national and local leadership. Mm -hmm. And I look at it every day. And what's so important to me is it doesn't say young leadership. It just says leadership. And so that means it's my life. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, not I can do this. I'm doing this. Yes. Thank you, Amanda. Devin. So for me, this question is really like a, a reflective question every time. Um, it's a storytelling part of, of, my, of my life, to be frank. Um, <coughs> so the city of Boston has an office called the Mayor's Office of Public Safety. Under that office, um, there was a program called Street Workers Program. Um, and what that program did, or, or it intended to do, because um, it did something um, I'm up here, um, and blessed to be up here, um, it, it, it was a diffuser in individual hoods and neighborhoods. So at the time, I was in a neighborhood um, doing what I needed to do to make money um, to bring home um, to Mom Duke. So the more money I made, the less she had to worry about me. I had siblings, so I was trying to take the burden off her shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I kind of grew up seeing uncles and aunts do. Um, um, you know, had an incarcerated father, um, all of those things. So for me, my mom taught me right from wrong my whole life. Um, I'm black and Puerto Rican, so that Latino side is strong. Um, um, and and in being in the streets, um, I found that street worker program. Um, they actually found me. I was, I was like a Friday, a Thursday, a Friday. I was in the neighborhood doing what I do, slang, drugs, whatever you want to call it, selling stolen goods, um, being that gang banger, being that at-risk youth. Um, had to be labeled at-risk first, I think, to, to, to get all this opportunity, um, which is the crazy part. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Maria, um, we call her Ms. She was my street worker. She was, so we had different neighborhoods um, in Boston. You got like a Dorchester, a Rawlingdale, Hyde Park, a JP. Um, but then you got individual hoods. They're like literally one street can be one hood and then the next street is another hood. So it's it get pretty crazy. So long story short, um, 
Maria was in my neighborhood. That was her, that her week to work in my neighborhood because they switch up. So street worker program, they had like 20 street workers. They go to each, each neighborhood and, and doing so, they know the active players. Um, and they're like a diffusing type of um, um, experience as well, I would say, um, because they know what's going on when, you know, they supposed to know what's going on, basically. They know, oh, the shooting might happen here. It's anniversary date here. That who's gonna, that hood's gonna retaliate. It's like, they were on the ground with us. Um, so Maria pulled me to the side one day. I was out there doing my thing. She's like, yo, D, what you doing? I'm like, what you mean? I'm doing what I know what to do. Like, what you mean? She's like, nah, like, and long story, another, another part of the story is that Maria grew up with my mom. So she's like a family friend at the same time. So we had that relationship. And that, that's the important part when you go to these neighborhoods and you go to the hoods. Like, if you don't got a working relationship with that, it can get real interesting. Um, um, so, so Ma Maria, um, she, I, I knew she always had my, my, my best intentions at heart. She comes up to me like, yo, there's this internship I want to sign you up for. I'm like, all right. She's like, but it's going to cost some, you know, you're going to have to change. It's going to cost, you know, it's going to be it's real deal. Like, I said, okay. I said, is it paid? I said, like, I need to make some money. <laughs> I ain't finna change my money through Friday if I'm not getting paid. Um, she said, it's a paid internship. I said, all right, I'll think about it. She said, no, you know, thinking about it. Like, I'm gonna come back tomorrow. I said, all right, well, you're gonna see me here because this is my job. Like, I'm outside. I'm, I'm gonna be here, so if you don't come, I'm gonna know because this is my job. Like, I'm gonna be outside. <laughs> um, so she comes back literally the next day. And it's now Friday, you know, end of the week. You, you celebrate in life, you know. You didn't think we were going to make it Monday through Friday. So that's when we outside with Coronas, drinking, congregating, you know, breaking bread. Um, Maria comes over with a clipboard. Everybody's looking at me like, why she got a clipboard and why she passing it to you for? <laughs> they, they, didn't, they, didn't get the, they didn't get the side story. Um, and I, I go to the side. I, I didn't let them in at that moment. I didn't let them in on what me, me and Maria had, had connected on. Um, she's like, yo, she, she shows me the, the um, application. I'm like, I got to sign this? Like, I got to do all of this? It's like a waiver, all some crazy. I'm like, I'm like, the streets is easier. Like, I don't, don't got to sign no waiver. I mean, there's a, there's a waiver that in life, but it, the streets was easier at that point. <laughs> um, so the, the internship um, was called Resilient Coders. So here I am, a kid from the hood, in a paid internship, learning how to code. So I'm a big believer, I'm gonna start something, I'm gonna finish it, no matter the taste in between. Um, it was like a 12 week boot camp. Um, successfully completed the whole boot camp, got paid those 12 weeks and some, cause at that point I'm still one foot in, one foot out. Like I, I gotta see this work for me to come over here. Like, um, so, so um, let me catch myself real quick. So um, the hardest part was being here but being there. Um, it was a lot of struggles because I'd go eight to five to my internship, but five to nine, five to, five to whatever, I'm outside. Um, so that, 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 that coding, I, I realized it wasn't for me. Like I didn't want to deal with computers. Like I didn't want to, it, it, it gave me a headache. Like all that code, all that was, was crazy. Um, but, but there's power in that, and there's money there, there's a good career. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to talk down on it. Um, so I was very reflective in the moment. I said, yo, that was great, but that wasn't for me. I said, but keep me in loop, because I'm still outside. Like, I still got to go make money. <laughs> um, so she says, okay. A few weeks go by, didn't see Maria. Um, she, I think she had moved to another neighborhood, um, but we, we got that contact. So then she comes back like, yo, I got this other internship for you. And I'm like, yeah? Once again, is it paid? <laughs> she's like, she's like, yeah. She's like, but this one's like professional pathways, it was called. Now I'm interning in like City Hall. She's like, you're gonna have to. And I said, oh, it ain't nothing to go to Macy's and buy a few suits. Like, hold up. Are you telling me I gotta dress up now? Because the resilient coders, I came as I you know, as I was. Now I'm in city. And I, and I still show up as I am. Um, but go to City Hall. Now I'm I'm a kid from Lydia. The neighborhood, walking in City Hall, seeing the mayor, seeing city council, seeing, seeing how the system works. Um, but in all of that, I noticed that it, it, it's 
there was always a level of exploitation. Mm. Had to be labeled at risk. Had I not been at risk, that first internship would have never been presented to me. That second internship would have never presented to me. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm still keeping this in the back of my mind. Like, yo, I, it's, it's not good. It's really not good that I'm, being, I'm not being able to get opportunity because I'm at risk. But I'm exploited too because you're exploiting me. Mm. <laughs> um, so the whole step of the way, I'm, still, I'm trying to figure it out, figure it out, still figure it out, but I'm growing now. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit over here now, almost two feet out, but I'm growing now. And then life starts happening because you know, life be life. And um, I got you know, my, best, my best friend, my brother, he got killed. Um, so you know, when things like that happen, you, you, you go right back outside. Um, it'll turn you away from all that progress that you just made. So that happened, fell again, but learned the power in second, third, four, five chances, you know, there's a power in those chances. Um, for me, it was my brother's keeper that changed my life. Um, it instilled like that sense of believer in me, that sense of belonging. Um, it allowed me to just fail, but also get back up. Um, and I can keep on going. I'm sorry, I'm long winded, y'all. <laughs> it's okay, thank you. But, but I, I do want to fast forward a bit, right? Because it was from being on the outside to, to very much being on the, what, what, are you, what are you doing now? So currently I'm a legislative aide at the state of Massachusetts. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Um, and thank you, thank you. Good job. And for me, that's the biggest thing. Um, I understood I was there. Somebody had to put me up. So I never lose sight of that. I always try to get back. So. Right, you know, right now I can pull up to the hood on a Friday looking like this and still have drinks with the fellas, but it's like understanding we still, act, we, we, we done grown. And I think for me it's leading by example, um, and, and, and that's been the biggest thing, having some of my, my peers, whether they're older or younger, like damn, D did that, it's possible. Um, so in legislation right now, my biggest, the biggest thing I do is not lose sight of who I still gotta bring up. Um, so I affect it at a legislative um, level where I'm passing out the money to organizations, while I'm writing the bills and the policies and laws, um, but I didn't see that then. Mm. All right. Thank that's, you for that. That's what this is about. Yeah. Thank you. That, from have, having policies made for him to now having his voice in shaping policy. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Devin. I want to move on, uh, move a bit to you know, what it's like to enter the movement to, at, at the national level. And I'll, I'll turn, Jamil and LaShawn, turn to the two of you. Um, you know, since its inception, mm. the OYF um, has intentionally engaged other national networks, national partners, folks who've been doing the work on the ground uh, uh, at the national level and engaging young leaders. And I'm very proud to say that the three of us came up through an organization mm. called Youth Build. Mm. And I'll pause for a second, and she's not in the room, but Monique yeah. mentioned her yesterday and just send out a, a, a thank you into the, into the universe to Dorothy Stoneman, yes. uh, a mother to many and a dealer of hope for people <laughs> like myself, Jamil and LaShawn. Um, and, and you guys, you had all already been leading, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't that like the network made you a leader. You had been leading through Youth Build, through the National Council of Young Leaders, through Opportunity Youth United. Um, and can you share a bit about sort of coming into the network and the last 10 years uh, Jamil, I've heard you literally say, I grew up in the movement, mm -hmm. right? S same, uh, th 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 how, how that has shaped your sense of self, sense of identity as a leader, and, uh, and the impact on your sort of your, your vision for the future. Who said your name? I love it, I love it. Uh -huh. I figured I'd start on the, on the far side coming in. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna I'm a keep I'm gonna keep an eye. Uh, so let me hit hit y'all with y'all. That's my Erica Badu. Peace and blessings, lessons learned. Right, we mm. manifesting. So the fact that um, I mentioned the husband, I mentioned the father, my medicine, and I appreciate my wife and my daughter being here. There was mm. levels of Get around applause. Was, yes, because they're gonna ground me. They're gonna ground me, and I'm looking at the timer, and I don't want to go more than two minutes, right? Um, there was levels of like me understanding even before and believing in something that was unseen. Mm -hmm. And there was a level of knowledge of self and understanding my grandmother being Muscogee Creek Nation and in massacre, people were literally placed in her acre, right? 
literally working and building a community. Grandma Joanne, I love you. The fact that I'm a forever mama's boy, losing my mom to lupus, and the, there was a time when my biological parents wasn't around, but mom Cynthia Alexander raising and nurturing the hell out of me. Let's say that, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a level of like, when I was trying to find myself as a young parent, it was my son, my daughter, and my wife who literally helped me understand like, who I am is who we are, and I literally want to manifest the fact that, I want to say this because like, this is the level of, <laughs> right? So peep game. My bot, like, my name is Jamil. If you don't know anything about the Hebrew, Israel, Hebrew, like, Hebrew Israelites and even the Muslim faith, my name means beautiful. So the fact that she prophesied this in my life, I'm just now getting to the understand the full clarity of who I am and my purpose. Like, and I'm saying that on purpose because, like, there's a level of, like, when I was, when I made some decisions, the system literally used that against us. But you understand, and we know these data and these systems and outcomes are literally made for black boys. We are the negative outcomes of systems that were created. So we are inclusive and we all here together. And this is why I love my family in a way where, like, I stopped going out and stopped doing what I wanted to do because I saw my son, my daughter, my wife watching me. Mm. So even as we were building a movement, I had to take care of home first and create those generational curses mm. of being stopped and me finding healing as we grew together. So my first day on this earth, I got my fist in the air. <laughs> <laughs> my first day on this earth. Stay humble, stay focused. Thank you for letting me. Now, I'll talk about, y'all know me when it comes to the OI movement, but I, there's a level of BMWP I think I need, you all need to understand. This is the meaning making meal I need y'all to understand. Mm -hmm. Because like people see me like, oh, Jamil, you happy, this and that. Man, I got black boy joy. I don't even lie. Mm -hmm. You know the hell I went through? Mm -hmm. Like Joel said, I came, I kind of came to this space already kind of in a leadership um, position. And in comparison to some of my other council members, I came into Aspen late. Like I wasn't there at the very first one, probably not the second one. Um, so I was, I think by the time I got here, um, I was at the time very hungry. Um, so I was coming in here like, I must have come shake the room. Yeah. Um, you know, I was leading OYU, and I was also in the process of starting my own nonprofit in my country in Cabo Verde. So I was like, okay, so this is Aspen. They got money. And, and if they don't got money, they know people who got money. Yeah. So I'm looking at the agenda, seeing who's in the room, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but money. what I ended up getting, mm -hmm. um, personally, I've built a lot of deep, meaningful relationships mm -hmm. with a lot of the young leaders here and allies that I'm sure most of them are going to last a lifetime. Um, so that I'm most uh, appreciative because um, that's, you know, leadership gets lonely. Um, and especially in the social justice space, so I, I just wanted to name that first. Um, a lot of professional development. Um, like I said, I was new. I was just coming in and just soaking up as much as I could to understand, like, what is this thing? Um, and how can I grow um, and build on my leadership um, through this network? And then also, like, a lot of leadership opportunities because, you know, every time I would get on a stage, like I am now, I would get off and then it would be, like, 20 people coming up to me, like, can you come speak here? Can you come speak here? Can we do this, do that? And I'm like, all right, fly me out. I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> so, fly me out. Fly me out. and it out. gets addictive. When you're young, you know, you're traveling, you're like, yeah. in awe, right? Yeah. Now I'm kind of like, okay, if I got to go through TSA one more time, <laughs> I'm going to lose it. Um, so, and, and then, you know, like, I would get, like, a lot of references, and um, they sent me to the Ideas Festival in Aspen. I don't know if y'all know about the Ideas Festival. The registration is, like, 10K. Come on. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, being able to um, be a part of those different opportunities, it wouldn't have happened if I wasn't connected to Aspen, so I really appreciate that. Um, professionally, we have built a lot of partnerships yes. through, this, through this network. Um, for example, right now, Opportunity United has about 23 community action teams in various communities across the country, similar to how Aspen has their collaboratives. And about half of our communities are backbones for Aspen. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
so, you know, that partnership has been critical and, and allowed me to step into my full leadership and continue to build the OIU movement. Um, we've got a, a whole bunch of community leaders as well, many of them in the room. Um, and then, you know, they may not be happy to hear this, but we've gotten some funding along, down the line, you know what I mean? Um, but again, without being in this space, I just think, um, you know, my leadership would have just been at a slower pace than it was. I'm gonna go get it, I'm gonna get it anyway. That's right. But it just, it just propelled me forward in ways that I couldn't imagine. Um, but now, um, you know, now I've become a yelder um, and I've been put in a position where I can bring other young people into this space mm -hmm. um, because it is truly a transformative space. Like I just mm -hmm. kind of laid that out for myself and they've done so, so beautifully. Uh, but it's also a very privileged space because mm -hmm. if you look at the ratio of adults and young people in the room, only one or two young people from each community get to experience this. Yeah. And just imagine if more young people could do this. Like, it'll, it'll really, when you talk about impact, like, if you look at young people who've been part of Aspen for a amount of years, like if you look at the roles that, and this dude's working for a state legislator, she's the director at United Way, and Hickam's leading work on a national level, like this is no child's play. So that this exposure really does make a difference in young people's lives, so I wanna continue to um, create that, those pipelines for them. Um, so yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I love it, baby. You both touched on you both touched on something around. Uh, you started talking about BMWP, uh, Jamil and Lashawn. You talked about sort of the power of connecting to others here, both adult allies, funders, some money, right? And, but also, especially to each other, building social capital as young leaders, as elders, as adults, and really going forward and being the leaders that other young people are going to be, you know, looking forward to meeting uh, going forward. And so, as as We've been talking a lot about belonging uh, over the course of the last two days. And as OYF, we'll be prioritizing and centering the belonging, belonging meaning-making, well-being, and purpose work. I always have to slow down when I say it, BMWP. Um, I like the BMW part. Uh, <laughs> um, what, uh, actually, I'm gonna go back to my question. Um, can you share your thoughts? Any, any relevant suggestions, recommendations, thoughts about the future of the BMWP and the OY movement, mm. right? You know, as at its early stage, yeah. right? You know, how can the BMWP work really center on the power of proximate leaders, mm -hmm. uh, the power and voice and lived experience of young people, and not just the lived experience, though, their, their, their expertise, mm -hmm. their leadership, the young people, the elders, and, and, the, folk, and the, the folks in this room. Yeah. Uh, this question is for an, anyone on the panel, not anyone in particular. Anybody. Why are you all looking at me? Somebody else go first. <laughs> I'll take it first. Um, for, for me, BMWP, um, it's literally something that you, you know, you gotta develop. You gotta you, you develop in life personally to even understand it, to even accept it. Um, I had to feel like I belonged. I had to feel like there was meaning in my belonging. I had to feel like this all made sense. I had to feel like this is it was just intentional. I had to see the purpose in it. Um, so, so for me, seeing it now and, and trying to ensure that we can continue to double down on, on, on our efforts in BMWP, um, it, I know it's going to go a long way. I know here at Collectively, we're not going to lose sight of it. Um, me and Israel just dropped the whole BMWP, um, literally EP, <laughs> seven tracks. We did it in six hours. Um, six hour studio session. He's a beast. Um, but there was purpose around that. Yeah. Um, the reason we did that is to be very intentional. Um, and, and as my great brother said, you heal through music, you heal through being creative. Um, and, and yeah, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Devin. I like to piggyback off of, I kind of just alluded to it, but he mentioned it too, how he still goes back to the block with his homies and he still dresses up and kind of like leads that example. And I did a lot of work in post-secondary education. Um, access and sense of belonging was like a big thing for uh, especially first generation opportunity yeah. to persist and i remember when i was going through college and um 
you know, people thought I wanted to go to school because I just generally like school, and I absolutely <laughs> did not. And <laughs> they'd be like, oh, you really like school? And I'd be like, you know, you should give it a try. And they'd be like, nah, that's corny, da 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 and I'd be in the air. But then they start to see the benefits, right? Mm -hmm. They got exposed to the benefits. They'll see all the different leadership opportunities I was getting, me catching flights, and they'd be like, yo, how can I get that job? How can I sign up for college now? Like, you can talk to a person and, and, and be up on the air, but that exposure, they have to see it and visualize it from someone that they, you know, can, can relate to, that they feel like has that, that type of connection. Um, so, again, just speaking to that belonging piece, it definitely takes more to, a, a bit more of, like, just talking to people saying, yeah, you should do this, you should do that. Like, you have to really put those real-life examples in front of them um, to really get them to see it, to see what it looks like in real life. Thank you, Rochelle. I'll, I'll add something, uh, not to embarrass Jamil, but when I joined, when I came for the first time in 2015, I was 21, I'd never flown without my family, I'd never been checking into a hotel by myself, all of these things, and I'd never been to a conference, and I was so scared, and I just remember you walked right up to me and said, oh my God, you're Amanda from Boston, welcome. Mm. And that's so important, and like, I remember me and Kim Pham sitting on the roof of the Limelight Hotel just <laughs> talking for hours. Mm -hmm. The young people in this room belong with each other and have been doing belonging work, mm -hmm. meaning making work, mm -hmm. and talking to each other about our purpose for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Ah. Well, look, that was a perfect alley-oop. Look, I mean, I was so... The next one, you know, I'm a visual learner, so I literally like to wanted to post this real quick. Go ahead, real quick, real quick. And this is where Amanda literally set me up real quick in a way where when you talk about BMWP, I tell her, like, and this is such a supervisor mo, right? Back in the day, y'all see the date on that, right? That was 12, we celebrating 10, but 12 years ago, we at Rockefeller Foundation, we making a hat, and for real, for real, I knew that then, because in the words of JoJo this morning, I belong. From the gate. So we might be celebrating 10, but I got to acknowledge the work. The great Melody Barnes being at the White House with John Brislin trying to figure out all the research, participatory research. And I'm like, I'm just from the block. But you know what? I'm here. So put me on. You feel me? But the belongs. The meaning making, I hit y'all with that early. The meaning making meal when it comes to my grandmother and the fact that I'm, on a, I'm in the front of my porch sitting, I'm sitting down in the streets of Philadelphia watching Power Rangers and a news flash come on and they're bombing my community. Move now, look it up. So I'm looking at it. What? This right here is morphin' time because we're going to continue to move on, right? That's the BMW, <laughs> right? Do we, do we, the W well, well being? It's a lifestyle for me. If you don't believe me, you can ask my son, my daughter, and my wife because I've been through so much hell. I need that time to really get his feel mm -hmm. and restore myself because I understand my garden and where I live in the place of the proximity, and I don't want my son and my daughter going through that, right? The purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven life, Right? I was, I was forced as a punitive measure to do community service, but it came purposeful because as I served my community, we all healed. So, so look, and we just going off energy. So the fact that we've been talking about BMWP since day one, we're here. You, you, J J Jamil, you said it's you said it's morphin time. I just want to put out there that I want to be the Green Ranger. Okay. <laughs> morphin time, so those Power Rangers, bro. I might be telling my age. Yeah, yeah. Morphin time. Once you speak, I'll be the black one. <laughs> See the black guy. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'll say ditto to everything everybody else shared. And the other thing I keep thinking about when we talk about belonging, and I'm loving this like positive uh, shift to positive investments and like promotion and thriving young people and what does it look like to create communities where we feel this sense of belonging, right? But I think um, as important as that work is, I feel like we also kind of miss this other conversation of like, why do we not feel the sense of belonging? Mm. Mm. And what really uncomfortable and tough conversations do we need to have about what those root causes are yes. and what is our commitment to dismantling what those things are to mm. ensure that the work of belonging and all of this mm. well-being that we're doing continues to exist and thrive and, and sustain itself, right? And so if, we, if we're creating a program where um, 
where belonging is centered, well-being is centered, and we still have to go back out into the same community where we don't get that, where it's racist, where it's homophobic, transphobic, right. all of these yeah. things, um, mm. that work kind of goes to waste, mm. right? Mm. So uh, what is our commitment to undoing just as well as it is to well-being and the thriving and all of that, too? Mm. Yes. Man. Yes. That, 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 that's why it's morphin time because those things are at risk right now. People are taking away rights, attacking who we are, mm. not letting us read books about who we are. Mm. Uh, so mm. it, it's morphin time. Um, mm. So that perfect segue into, I, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, uh, into a, a final question. You know, I think back to um, also growing up in the moment, also growing up in sort of it, in the opportunity youth sector back when we were at risk or troubled youth, right? Uh, yeah. That's uh, a label. That's a label. Right? Trouble youth at risk all team. Badass. Disconnected. Yeah. So I, I, I want to tap into your, so your vision, expertise, and recommendation for how we move forward. And how, what would your uh, call to the field, so including policymakers, philanthropy, mm -hmm. the private sector, future partners in democracy, what would that call be for action that will build pipelines that expand opportunities for local and national leadership from some to many to all? Yeah. Because yeah. we're, still, we're still somewhere along that yeah, uh, continuum. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to start. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 um, I think there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, you've heard from every single person in this space about how investments like these have made great impact in our lives, right? And we've been having these conversations with a lot of the young people that are in this space. We spent so much time yesterday talking about what this space means to us. We recognize how much of a privilege it is um, for us to be here, but it also should not be a privilege for us to be here. Um, Talk to them, especially because we're talking about opportunity youth. This room should be majority opportunity youth, right? And so um, I guess number one is continue to invest in this work. Continue. And with investment, we also were talking about how, what does it look like to genuinely invest the impact on individual young people, and that only happens when you make long-term investments. Um, you, I, I've had so many conversations with funders, with policymakers, who want to see something happen in 18 months, in two years. That is not realistic yeah. at yeah. all. And so longer, long, long-term, five-year-plus investments, um, if you really want to see impact on young people. And then the other thing is, we've been talking about in, investing in, um, Youth-led youth work, making sure that young people are at the center of this work. I know Jamil and Lashawn and Amanda and every literally everybody on this stage, and many many others who aren't up here have been committing their life to uh, to that work. And we're we still have so much work to do, yeah. especially in this space, yeah. to authentically to say that we have authentically engaged young people. Um, and so, again, I'm just repeating something that I know we've been saying for many many years. Yeah. I know you all have been saying for many many years, but truly engage young people from the very, very, very beginning. Um, we have always said, you know, young people are experts in their traumas and experiences, but also in their in solutions for communities, but also in our joy. Yes. And so what does it look like to um, fully create spaces where from the very beginning, because uh, adults say they bring young people into the space, but there's already expectations in place for what you want those young people to accomplish. Uh. And you have to remove those expectations if you really want authentic youth engagement. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and then my last piece is, well, there's two other pieces. My, Go ahead! <laughs> one, <laughs> one, you can't do um, youth engagement work without doing equity work, and you can't do equity work without doing youth engagement work. So we have to boldly and um, loudly say and um, commit to the, what that work looks like and, and engage young people throughout that process. And then the last piece, again, is um, I think the whole purpose of this panel is to talk about what it looks like for us to transition throughout our youngness, adulthood, and all of, all of that pathways, right? So um, how do we make sure that as we're bringing new young people into the space, that we actually retain other young people that have been part of this space too? So um, huge investments in like transitional leadership. I know for the National Council of Young Leaders, we just had a re retreat in Dallas, and that's something that's really important to us in figuring out what is an actual pipeline? What does sure. actual journey look sure. like of us like, creating a true community that is filled with people of all ages and intergenerational space that is actually intergenerational? Yes, yes. And so investment in that type of work and like capturing what that journey looks like so people don't just 
drop off and you bring on new people throughout. Yes, yes. Mic drop it. Yes, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, again, open to whoever. The question, um, help me out real quick. Sure. What would your recommendation be uh, to policymakers, philanthropy, the private sector, and future partners in democracy for action that will create opportunities that are there for you know, going from some to many to all. Okay, because um, I feel like, oh, man, just a clean slate on that. So I'm literally mm -hmm. going to have, I, I would love yeah, to take a, uh, um, a personal retrospective vibe mm -hmm. because there's a level of, like, knowledge of self that when you understand and start healing who you are and literally, there's, a, mm -hmm. there's, there's just so much power in it because as much as I went through and understanding, you know, the generational harm that was caused by things that were set up, um, by othering, like we literally, we've created something where everyone is, where everything and everyone, everyone wants to belong to now. But in the beginning, there was a level of like, and I was, I'm, going, I'm referring back to Dr. G's um, uh, asset framing in a way where like he had the two sides in a way where like, you know, the different language of like, oh, okay, you know, and reimagining, rediscovering, and I'm kind of going back in my ten years because I remember they was like, ooh, I would do to you. Like, what is that? We don't want that here. You feel me? So with that being said, like, there was a level of, like, me understanding who I am and where we belong because I told you to see me as we because, like, I was a young father. And it was places where even in this moment and in this place and this time, the fact that I'm, I'm blessed, that privilege that you talked about, I'm blessed to be here with my children in a way where I am my queen, in a way where, like, there was times that they wasn't even allowed. And I, start, I stopped going to places. L, I remember that. Like, oh, fly me out. Oh, well, we can't pay for your lady. Oh, okay, I'll see you on the Zoom. Matter of fact, I'll see you on the Skype. You feel me? So, so to bring it back, to bring it back, right? But as I grow in this pipeline as well, and this is another thing as far as a root, as far as youth in America, where like there was levels of like that leadership development that was placed in me early in the way like, okay, I know I may not be a young and I may not be a elder, but I am Jamil, I am Bro JLA, I am Mill, I am half a male, I am all of the above because I am full Sweet manifestation man. of like on as a human being. So 2020, 2021. Rest in peace, Brother Aubrey, Brother Floyd, Sister Clayton, Brianna. There was a level setting in that moment when I knew, even in my age, in a way where like the young people was out there. And the fact that I was asked to be in that space and we kind of like, went to policies and even in my local community of sometimes York County, which literally had a, <laughs> the first time I saw the KKK in real life was 2004 and the fact that mm. the insurrection was housed in York County, and then they went to the Capitol on the 6th. I can't make this stuff up, y'all. So the level settling of youth-led change and me understanding where the young people wanted to go, I still offer myself in service. And so whether you're in philanthropy, whether you're whoever you are, like, it's the collective. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I'm going to check my notes and cross out anything Hikma already said. Uh, so first, I just want to name, there was no pathway for me to get this job, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. I was part of Youth Voice Project. We got paid $13 an hour to work six hours a week. And then we said, we want to do actually some more work so that we actually are doing something. You can't mm -hmm. accomplish very much in six hours a week. Then I said, well, I've been a part of this for two years. I want to be a senior peer leader. Then I said, I actually want to coordinate this project. Then I said, I want to take on other jobs because part-time work does not make ends meet, mm -hmm. particularly when we talk about the current context. Mm -hmm. And so I was piecing together two, three, four, five jobs working event security so that I could still be in this work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were a lot of times where I thought, I can't stay in this work and make a living. I can't do this and keep my lights on at the same time. But I knew that this is where I needed to be. So. That's one piece of it. A second piece of it is like, y'all, we do pathway work. Mm -hmm. If we can build pathways for young people to be entrepreneurs, to be in hospitality, to get into the trades, right. you can build it for your own jobs. Right. That makes no sense. That should be the easiest lift that we can do, is make that space in our own institutions and our own organizations, because if you say you care about opportunity youth, you say you want to engage them, you say you want to invest them, you can't just drop them after a little while. 
You can't give me an experience at a community-based organization and then be surprised that I love it and I want to stay in it. Come on. And I want to grow in it. Uh, and so that's part of it. I also think uh, the, this is really like some, some of that moral change work, right? So you need to stop looking at our yelders as yelders and like really take them for what they are, which is professionals. Mm. And wouldn't all of our organizations and institutions be so much better off if they were full of Jamil's mm. and Hikma's and Lashans and Devin's? Amanda's. 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 Amanda's, that's right. And can I just do a real quick poll? So if you're a young leader, can you raise your hand? If you are a young leader with a full-time job and benefits, keep your hand up. Mm. That should be the whole room. Ooh. That should be the whole room. How are they going to be able to take care of their wellness if they don't have health care? Oh. Right? How do we take oh. care of wellness if you don't have stability? I think that's really, really important. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Oh. Ah. I, keeping an eye on the clock. But, but, I have nothing to say. After that. <laughs> <laughs> between those two, they just ate my response right on <laughs> All right, all right. I'll add something to be brief, um, because I always like to chase the money. So keep on pu pulling your checkbooks out, keep on pouring us that way, so that this can happen. Um, at that level, um, funding the most important part of organizational capacity, <coughs> funding the, at the core of every conversation. Um, so I'll say funding. I'll say definitely keep them working relationships. Understand mm -hmm. what your backyard looks like. Everybody's backyard can be different. Mm -hmm. um, so they may be, you know, strengths in Boston that may not by be strengths in, 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 in Yorktown. Um, and then the biggest thing is having those working relationships with people who are making the decisions um, and, and holding those legislators, holding elected officials accountable um, and, and, and keep that testimonial. Don't lose sight of, of the work um, and, and why you want to do it, but keep the, the youth at the core of everything. Be very intentional. Pour into them, not just the funding wise as well, because we get lost in, in, in the whole process of it all, um, but pour into me health wise, pour into me um, emotional, pour into me. Um, just keep on pouring into the youth. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. Just, it's, it's clear we continue to create these spaces, but not just these spaces here, but these spaces back in communities where young mm -hmm. people can build, feel a sense of purpose, belonging, meaning making, and invest in the long term, not just in the immediate solution, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 as, and young, young people are young, but they're also professionals. They're adults. They're, they're intelligent. They have expertise. And they bring a vision that sometimes as we get older, we stop, we stop imagining, right? That's and right. so important to recognize them, not just as young people, but as our partners. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've got a few minutes left. Can I take one or two questions? No. One? No. Oh, OK. Oh, okay. oh <laughs> that was answered for me. I didn't see that. <laughs> there you go, man. I'm ready to go. You mentioned if you're a young person that's doing this work but also has a full-time job with benefits and everything, that takes time. So how would you best suggest that you can pour everything that you have into the youth that you're feeding into mm -hmm. and also go to work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you balance that, I guess? Let's take that one. Anybody? I think I could start. I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm grateful that that is my work, that is my full-time work, but I, and I think that might, I don't want to speak for you, but I think that might be what you're getting at too, that like, when I was growing up, I did not know that this was a career I could have. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many incredible opportunities out there that a lot of our young people don't know about that have really important impact in community. And so I think for folks in the room, for a lot of us, it's like, what does it look like to create environments where young people are filling your director positions, your whatever positions that you yeah. have available mm -hmm. that are specifically talking about young people. Um, so I think that that would help, right? Like combining those two so that you're not having to balance those two. I also was in the same environment where I like, was like working six different yeah. jobs and uh, contracts and things like that. Um, and I think the other thing is we just have to pay young people better, to be honest. Yeah. When, we, when we pay for youth engagement, it is not the amount we pay can cope in. So, um, one thing that we've done in Seattle is making, uh, at least in a very specific project that I'm working on, not everywhere in Seattle, um, is making sure that anytime we brought young people on for their expertise, that we pay them consultant fees. That's right. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? I'm keeping an eye on the clock. <laughs> All right, we, I, we made it before the hour. Yeah. An hour, a, a minute and 19 seconds on the clock. I want you all to join me in giving them, our partners, an amazing a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> give me something. Look, it's a love fest. Give me something. Which way we go? We exit. This, this group of amazing people will be available for pictures, bookings, and autographs right after this panel. Yes, love. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. So we're gonna go ahead. We're gonna go ahead and wrap up, because um, we are we are all like you know paying very very close attention to the time. But here's here's the final offering that I want to make to everyone in the room, and this is actually an offering of reciprocity. And it's it's reciprocity around storytelling, so that it's not just our young leaders, it's not just our elders, it's not just these professionals who are sharing their stories, and particularly these stories about turning pain into power, but it also becomes part of how we hold and share space together and through our journeys demonstrate mutual respect for each other. And I wanna also connect the dots between what we heard Dr. G and John Powell share. So here are the four words that are in my mind, heart, and soul. I'm thinking about John Powell and what he shared around structures, and I'm thinking of what Dr. G sh shared around vision. I'm also thinking about the relationship between structures and vision, healing and belonging. And under all of that is narratives and JoJo's powerful call that we are all opportunity youth and our stories matter. So I want to very, very quickly and briefly because everybody who knows me knows that I love starting and ending on time, so I feel so mindful of that. But I want to, like Dr. G did, I wanna call my mother, Teresa Morris, into this space because she was a single mom who had me when she was 20 years old, and I was her second child that she birthed at that time. And I also wanna tell you about the community that I was born into, Harlem, because the other thing that JoJo talked about earlier was how our zip code is supposed to determine our destiny when people don't know and understand the power, the beauty, and the assets of the community that you were born into is, right? but I was born in Harlem and I was raised in Harlem, so that meant that I played outside all day with my friends. We played stickball, we played Ringo Levia, but we also listened to music. It was in the backdrop of everything. And I want you to know this. If you went outside and played and you did anything at all, your mother heard about it before you even got home because every elder in the community was looking out for you. We had 50 Cent Cherry Cocoa. Raise your hand if you know about 50 Cent Cherry Cocoa. Who knows about, okay, okay. Well, because back in the day, right, right? But when you wanted more, right? And then the last thing is, I jumped double dutch all day long, all day long. Don't get no rope out in front of me, y'all, okay? But this is what I want you to know. What I want you to know is that um, my mother, just like Dr. G talked about, she might have been born into a zip code that was supposed to determine her destiny, but she had a vision. She had a vision for her babies. And her vision ultimately led into this middle school called Dallas Hall Academy. It was specifically created for black and Latino, high performing children to get them into independent schools. And when I landed at Dallas Hall Academy, it was about academic prep, but more importantly, it was about healing, love, and belonging. We didn't have that language, but they were so committed to affirming our identity as black and Latino people from a community of love and assets that that's how I was prepared when I transitioned into boarding school. The problem, y'all, is that when I transitioned into boarding school, it wasn't ready for me, right? So I was the only black girl in my grade, and I got to this place, and I was ready to do my work because just like Jamil talked about, I understood my purpose. I understood my calling, I understood my assignment, but the place, the institution that I was in, that wasn't ready. They didn't understand, they didn't understand, just like Josh talked about the harm that these institutions and systems do to our children, that was my story 
And I need y'all to know, because I was a woman about her business, I was in this place, and I was trying to organize without the language, but I understood. I felt the system, I felt the structure, and I understood my work. But I was trying to organize for the, children, the students of color. I was trying to create spaces of belonging for us. I was trying to get the institution to support us, and it wasn't ready. And what that led to was my senior year, I was voted the person who most needed a mother. So I'm, I'm going to say it again. I was voted the person by my classmates who most needed a mother. And everything, that gasp, that sigh, that said in my soul, it said in my soul, that dehumanization, and probably just because I'm human, the thing that I did to protect myself so that I would never, ever, ever, ever again have to be dehumanized, so degraded, was I stopped using my voice. I disconnected from my power, my purpose, my vision. And I want you to know this, two decades, two decades of my life of um, remaining quiet, of feeling something in my spirit, feeling something in my soul that I'm supposed to say, I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to act, but I was paralyzed by this dehumanization, the, what I had experienced. And then I got this job at the Aspen Institute. So, you know, again, you know this, this like our, our pain becomes our power on our journey. We are healing and our healing comes our liberation work. That is what this work has been for me here. And you know, the reason why I'm telling you my story is because really what I'm communicating to you all is how thankful I am because my healing work has been my liberation work my work in serving communities and partnering with our young people and, and, and um, working with philanthropy, um, thinking about the, the dream that people have been talking about, the visioning people have been talking about, this future of tomorrow, that the work of our hands, the work of our hearts that we are going to create when JoJo talked about what our babies will be talking about 10, 15 years from now, this world of belonging, all of that has been part of my own healing, the ways in which I've been nourished so that every day I could wake up and do this work in partnership with all of you. So when I say thank you, I want you to know it comes from my mind, it comes from my heart, but it also comes from my soul. I have been so honored to be on this journey with all of you. And our work continues. Our, our, our professionals just reminded us that we have so much more work to do. And I'm honored, y'all. I'm honored to be on this journey with y'all. I want to say thank you for trusting us. Thank you for being in relationship with us. But thank you for helping me to be on this journey because see what I tell my babies, my Elijah, my Ella, and my Emerson Grace, when it's time to leave and they say, Mommy, you're leaving again? I tell them, I said, babies, now I got two jobs. My first job is to prepare you for this world. But my job at the Aspen Institute is to prepare the world for you. <laughs> Right? That's right. 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 So that's what our work is. And I'm so thankful I get to do this work with all of you. Thank you, Aspen, Opportunity Forum family. Hey, Mill, Mill, can we say thank you to Monique for putting all this together with one heartbeat? Or not. Thank you, Yelena. Uh, Monique just had a drop the mic moment, and she forgot to drop the mic, so I'm going to put it down and just say thank you. Thank you. It's great to be an allyship. The one thing I, I think should translate is no one should have to have been as resilient as you had to be. And that's why we're moving from resilience to thriving and belonging. That's why. And to just finish on Joelle's point, and then we're really done, from one to some to many to most to all in this journey on belonging we're going to all do together. We got a lot to learn and we're going to follow your lead. So thank you all and thank you Monique.